Welcome! In this video, we'll be proving completeness of the natural deduction proof calculus for propositional logic. Now, in the last video, we saw soundness, which said that whenever we can prove some formula psi using natural deduction from some set of assumptions gamma, well, then this semantic sequence holds that gamma models psi, which means that whenever we have a sigma structure that makes all of the formulas in the set of hypotheses gamma true, then also the formula psi is true. We're now going to prove that the opposite implication also holds, so that's completeness. So it says that whenever we have this semantic sequence here, so that the set of hypotheses models the formula psi, then also we can prove the formula psi from the set of hypotheses gamma using natural deduction. In particular, if we choose gamma to be the empty set, then this thing just says that psi is a tautology, so psi holds in every sigma structure. So if psi is a tautology and it holds in every sigma structure, then completeness tells us that we can prove the formula psi from no assumptions using natural deduction. This suggests that completeness is quite a strong property. So soundness basically says that we chose good rules when we designed our proof calculus so that uh, our proof calculus doesn't prove false formulas from true hypotheses. On the other hand, it's much harder to think about how you would go about designing a complete proof calculus because um, it's not just a thing where you have to make sure that your rules are good rules, rather you have to know what rules to include. And so it's always possible that you didn't include enough rules and that you're somehow missing uh, proofs for certain formulas. So from this perspective, it's astonishing that we can actually come up with a complete proof calculus, namely natural deduction. And this will maybe also explain why proving completeness for natural deduction will be much more involved than proving soundness. To make things a bit simpler, we're not going to prove completeness for the entire language of propositional logic. Rather, we're going to just focus on a reduced language which only includes three connectives, namely conjunction, negation, and the absurdity symbol. I'll be calling this language RLP for reduced language of propositions. And um, it turns out that, in fact, every formula of usual propositional logic is equivalent to some formula that can be expressed using only these three connectives. In other words, you can express all other logical connectives using just these three. So despite the fact that we're um, focusing on this reduced language. In fact, a proof of completeness for this reduced language will also prove completeness for the entire language of propositional logic if you make precise the argument that every formula in usual propositional logic is equivalent to one in reduced uh, propositional logic. The main new definition we'll need for this video is that of a syntactically consistent set of formulas. So we call a set of formulas syntactically consistent if that set, gamma, does not entail absurdity. In other words, a set is syntactically consistent if it's impossible to prove a contradiction based on formulas occurring in that set. The reason this concept of syntactically consistent sets is useful is because we can basically just restrict our attention to those when proving completeness. So suppose that we have some set, gamma, which proves an absurdity, well, if this sequence is true, that means that there exists some proof of absurdity using just assumptions in gamma. Well, in that case, also um, this, the following sequence is true. So we can prove absurdity based on gamma unioned with the negation of any formula phi. So this sequence also holds because, well, if we can prove absurdity based on assumptions occurring in gamma, then we can also prove absurdity based on assumptions occurring in this larger set. And then, well, by the reductio ad absurdum rule, we can then conclude that we can prove uh, the formula phi based on the set gamma. So recall that the reductio ad absurdum rule allows us to take some set of formulas which is inconsistent, i.e. produces a contradiction, and conclude that, well, one of those formulas can't hold, so we can move the negated formula here over to the, the other side. 
In other words, what this argument here is saying is that if we have some syntactically inconsistent set, so inconsistent sets will prove any formula. Now, if you look back to the uh, statement of the completeness theorem, we see that its conclusion is at the form that gamma uh, entails some formula psi. And I've now just shown you that whenever gamma is inconsistent, then this uh, well sequence here holds for any formula psi. And therefore, we don't need to think about inconsistent sets gamma because completeness will hold for them anyways. We can use this idea that inconsistent sets will prove any formula to uh, transform the problem of proving completeness into something um, that's easier to deal with. This is the content of the following lemma. So it says that in order to prove the completeness property, it's sufficient to show the following, namely that every syntactically consistent set gamma has a model. If we just were to prove completeness directly for syntactically consistent sets, well, then we would have to show that whenever a set gamma models a formula psi, which is a sort of semantic notion, then we can prove the formula psi from gamma using natural deduction. So that's like a syntactic notion. So in that case, we somehow have both of these, these worlds, and we'd have to somehow com convert the assumption that gamma models psi into an actual natural deduction proof that, well, shows that also gamma entails psi. Now, in fact, what this lemma here is doing is it's saying that to prove completeness, it's in fact sufficient to just show that every syntactically consistent set gamma has a model. So this is a purely uh, semantic thing where we just need to come up with a model for um, any syntactically consistent set. Okay, so let's move on to the proof of this. So for this, we suppose uh, that every, uh, well, syntactically consistent set has a model. And now we need to show that in this case, completeness will hold. Okay, so to show completeness, we need to, well, suppose uh, that, well, gamma models some formula psi like this. And now we need to show that there is in fact a natural deduction proof of the conclusion psi based on assumptions in gamma. We now claim that the, the set where we look at gamma unioned with not psi, so we claim that this has no models. Okay, why is this true? Well, let's call this uh, here star. So the fact that gamma models the formula psi. What, what does star mean? So star is just telling us that um, whenever we have a sigma structure that makes all of the uh, formulas in gamma true, then also psi is true. So by star, uh, we know that, well, every model of uh, gamma is uh, also a model of the formula psi. Okay, but what does this mean? Well, if it's a model of the formula psi, it means that psi is true in that sigma structure. But in turn, this also means that the negation not psi is false in that sigma structure. Hence, we can conclude that every model of gamma which by star is also a model of psi, can't be a model of not psi. So hence is not a model of the negation not psi. And that already proves the claim because in order for a sigma structure to be a model of this set of formulas here, it would have to be a model for each formula in the set. Now we know that if the sigma structure is a model for all of the formulas in gamma, well, then by the argument I just gave, it can't also be a model for the negation not psi, and hence there's no sigma structure that can be a model for all of these formulas simultaneously. Okay, so with that we've proved this claim that this set here doesn't have any models. 
But now by our assumption, we know that every syntactically consistent set has a model. And therefore, we can conclude that, in fact, this set is not syntactically consistent. Okay, so since uh, this set here um, has no models, uh, well, it can't be syntactically consistent. And well, what does this mean? It means that this set, in fact, entails the absurdity. However, now we're in the same situation as before. So we now have exactly the sequent that we can use reductio ad absurdum on in order to conclude that, in fact, gamma entails psi. So therefore, by the reductio ad absurdum rule, we have that gamma entails psi. OK, and with that, we're actually done with the proof of this lemma. So let's go uh, through it again. The lemma states that in order to prove completeness, it suffices to show that every syntactically consistent set gamma has a model. OK, to prove this, we first suppose that, well, in fact, every syntactically consistent set gamma does indeed have a model. And now we want to show that this uh, implies completeness. Now, completeness was uh, the statement that whenever gamma models psi, then also gamma proves psi. So to prove this implication, we first assume that gamma models psi like this. And then we notice that, in fact, this assumption here uh, implies that this set here doesn't have any models. Why is this? Well. Because of this assumption, we know that every model of the set gamma is also a model of the formula psi. And hence, every model of the set gamma can't be a model of the negated formula not psi. Finally, by our assumption that we suppose that every syntactically consistent set has a model, um, we can now conclude that because this set here doesn't have any models, it can't be syntactically consistent. Now, because being syntactically consistent means that you can't prove the absurdity from the, your set, it means that if you're not syntactically consistent, you in fact can prove absurdity based on that set. And now we can just apply the sequent rule for uh, reductio ad absurdum to conclude that in this case, in fact, our set of assumptions uh, will proves the formula psi. We're going to go about proving that every syntactically consistent set of formulas has a model in two steps. In the first step, we're going to define something called a Hintika set, for which we can easily show that every such Hintika set has a model. Then in a second step, we're going to show that every syntactically consistent set of formulas can be extended to a Hintika set. And we know that, the, well, this extended Hintika set will have a model, and therefore also the subset, which was the original syntactically consistent set of formulas, will also have a model. Let's start by defining a Hintika set. So we call a set of formulas gamma a Hintika set if the following five conditions hold. So the first condition says that whenever we have a conjunction, phi and psi, occurring in the set gamma, then both components of the conjunction also lie in the set gamma. So both phi is an element of gamma and also psi is an element of gamma. Second, whenever we have a negation of a conjunction occurring in the set gamma, so whenever the formula not phi and psi lies in gamma, then not phi is an element of gamma or not psi is an element of gamma. So this condition might seem a bit weird. So why is this formula of interest? Well, by De Morgan's law, this formula here is equivalent to not phi or not psi. And so essentially what this point is saying is that whenever we have a disjunction of formulas occurring in gamma, uh, then in fact, the, either of the components of the disjunction need to lie in gamma. So either the first component lies in gamma or the second component lies in gamma or both of them lie in gamma. Now, the reason we can't express uh, this directly is because in this reduced language here, we don't have the disjunction symbol. So we have to encode disjunction uh, using this equivalent formulation here. 
Moreover, we have the third property of a Hinteka set, which says that whenever we have a double negation occurring in gamma, then also the original formula occurs in gamma. So whenever not not phi is an element of gamma, then phi is an element of gamma. The fourth property says that the absurdity symbol is not contained in gamma. And this makes sense because if we want uh, our Hintika set to have a model, well, then we shouldn't include absurdity because any set of formulas that includes absurdity doesn't have any models because the truth value of absurdity is always false. And finally, there's point five, which concerns propositional symbols or atomic propositions. The fifth property says that there's no propositional symbol P such that both P and its negation not P occur in the set gamma. Again, this is an intuitive condition for a set that you would want to be able to construct a model for, because if your set contains both P and not P, well, if you want to construct a model, then P has to be true, so you'd have to assign a truth value of true to the atomic proposition P. On the other hand, that assignment will always make not P false, and therefore such a set wouldn't have any models. So these five conditions are what we want from a Hintika set, as I explained, these last two conditions are sort of obvious conditions you need in order to be even able to construct models for a set. And these first three conditions somehow allow you to, uh, well, reduce more complicated formulas in your set to simpler ones that also need to occur in your set. We're now going to show how these properties of Hintika sets pay off by showing that every Hintika set has a model. So to prove this, we're going to explicitly construct a sigma structure that will be a model for some Hintika set. So for this, we let uh, gamma be a Hintika set. And uh, we define a sigma structure uh, using the following uh, assignments. So we let a of p uh, be equal to true if the propositional symbol p occurs in the set gamma. And well, we let uh, a of p be false otherwise. So if uh, p does not occur in gamma. Now this first part of the definition here uh, needs to hold if we want the sigma structure a to be a model of gamma because well, we want a to make every formula in gamma true, in particular, every uh, atomic proposition that occurs in gamma should be true. On the other hand, it'll turn out that this assignment down here, so assigning false to propositional symbols that don't occur in gamma, will uh, produce a model for, for gamma using the properties of Hintika sets. So our proof will be complete if we manage to prove the following claim, which is that um, for every uh, R, L, P, sigma formula, so phi, uh, we have the following. So there's two points. So if uh, phi is an element of our Hintika set gamma, well, then uh, gamma is a model for phi, or another way of saying that is that A star of phi is equal to true. And on the other hand, uh, if the negation of phi lies in our set gamma, well, then we would want, uh, well, our formula here to have truth value false. So the original formula phi should be assigned the truth value of false. Okay, so if we prove the claim here, then in particular point A of the claim says that well, if some formula occurs in gamma, well, then the truth value of that formula under the sigma structure A is true. And therefore, part A in turn just means that, well, A is a model for uh, every formula in the set gamma and therefore is a model for the entire set gamma. So in particular, part A here implies that A um, is a model uh, for the set gamma. Now, the reason we're also including part B here in the claim is because we'll be proving this claim by induction and having this uh, second part of the claim will prove useful in the inductive step. 
Okay, so let's move on to proving this claim. So we're going to prove the claim by induction uh, on the complexity of the formula phi. Recall that the complexity of a formula is just the number of connectives occurring in it. Now the base case here, which I'll call case zero, is that, well, phi is equal to some propositional symbol p. So it's some uh, p occurring in our signature sigma. Well, then by definition, the extended truth value that we assign to p is just whatever our sigma structure assigns to p. And now we verify both these claims. So if uh, phi, which is just equal to p, lies in our set gamma, well, then we know by the definition of a that, well, in that case, a assigns the truth value true to p. So let's call this definition star. So then by uh, star, we have that uh, a of p is equal to true. And the, this shows uh, point A here. So point A says that if our formula uh, lies in gamma, so that's what we're assuming here, well then A star of the formula needs to be true. And here we've shown that A of p is true, but A of p is just equal to A star by definition. On the other hand, if the negated version of phi, so in our case this is not p, is an element of gamma, well, then by property five of Hintika sets, we know that P cannot be an element of gamma. So five implies uh, that uh, P does not lie in gamma because in a Hintika set, we never both have an uh, atomic proposition P occurring together with its negation. So if the negation lies in gamma, then P can't lie in gamma. All right, but then by star, so by the definition of our sigma structure, we now know that in fact, our sigma structure A uh, assigns a value of false to P. So this is because we know now that P does not lie in gamma. So, and hence we uh, conclude that well also A star of P is equal to false. Okay, so this first part here proves A and this second part proves B in the case where we have complexity zero, uh, so our formula is just an atomic proposition. We now move on to the remaining case for atomic propositions, which I'll call case zero prime. So in this case, uh, phi is equal to the absurdity symbol. So we now again need to show both uh, parts A and B of the claim for, for this case. However, by property uh, four of Hintika sets, we know that the absurdity symbol can't be contained in our set gamma. So hence we can conclude that A holds because the assumption here in A uh, doesn't apply. On the other hand, by definition, we know that the truth value of absurdity is always false. And this means that, well, the conclusions of part B will always hold, and therefore the implication that is part B is also true. So hence uh, B also holds. All right, so with that, we've also verified that these claims uh, hold when our formula is just the absurdity symbol. And with that, we've covered all atomic uh, formulas. So case zero and zero prime, these just concern the atomic formulas which have complexity zero. All right, we now move on to formulas which are not atomic. So I'll call this case one. So phi could be the negation of some formula psi. So we somehow again apply our unique parsing theorem. So we know that, well, phi in this case in the reduced language is either the negation of some formula or a conjunction of some formula. So this is where assuming this reduced language pays off because, well, if we were to do this in the entire 
uh, propositional logic language, then we have a bunch of cases, one for each connective. So here we only have two connectives, which means that we'll only have two cases for uh, phi being a, a non-atomic formula. All right, so we're now in this case where phi is of the form not psi. And by induction, because psi is a strictly less complex formula than phi, we can assume that both of these claims hold for the formula psi. So by induction, we know that the formula psi uh, satisfies uh, both A and B. We now need to verify that A and B also hold for this more complex formula, not psi. So for the first uh, part, we assume that well, phi, which is equal to not psi, uh, lies in the set gamma. And we now need to show that, well, then the truth value of not psi should be, well, one. Okay, but now we know that psi itself satisfies both A and B. In particular, B says that, well, if the negation of psi lies in gamma, then the truth value of psi is zero. So, uh, by B for Psi, we conclude that A star of Psi is equal to false. Uh, hence, by definition, um, A star of not Psi is equal to true because, well, the extended uh, truth value function here just inverts truth values when you negate a formula. Okay, and this already uh, proves uh, property A, so we've assumed that not psi lies in gamma, and we've concluded that, well, in this case, the truth value of this formula, not psi, is true. On the other hand, for point B, we uh, need to assume that the negation of our formula lies in gamma. So if not phi, uh, which is equal to not, not psi, right, if this lies in gamma, then we need to uh, show that, in fact, uh, a star of our formula phi is equal to false, which means that a star of not psi is equal to false. All right, but this uh, situation here where we have this double negation lying in gamma is also one of the things we covered in the definition of a Hintika set. So if this holds, well, then uh, by a property, I believe it's three of our Hintika set, we have that also uh, the original formula psi lies in gamma. But now again, we know that psi satisfies both A and B. In particular, A says that if psi lies in gamma, then the truth value of psi is true. So by uh, property A applied to psi, we know that A star of psi is equal to true. Okay, and again, by definition, uh, this means that a star of not psi is equal to false. And that's exactly what we want to show for property B for the formula, uh, well, not phi. So right, this here is just the formula phi. And so we've shown that if not phi is an element of the set gamma, well, then A star of phi is equal to false, which is exactly what property B requires. So I've now removed case zero prime to make some more space. And we can now move on to the final case, which I'll call case two, which is that uh, phi has the form a conjunction between formulas. So it's of the form psi and chi uh, for formulas psi and chi. Now, again, by induction, uh, both A and B hold for uh, psi and chi. And we now need to show properties A and B for this more complex formula phi. Now for point A, we uh, well su suppose that phi, which is this conjunction here, uh, lies in our set gamma. Uh, then by the first property of Hintika sets, we know that both the formula psi and also the formula chi lie in gamma. So we know that psi lies in gamma uh, and also chi lies in gamma. 
Now, because, well, both of these formulas satisfy our claim, we can conclude that the truth value of both of these formulas is true. Okay, so by our inductive assumption, we know that a star of psi is the same as a star of chi, uh, which is true. Uh, but then by definition, so of the extended truth value function, we also know that the conjunction is true. So by definition, this shows that a star of the conjunction psi and chi is equal to true, and that shows property A. On the other hand, uh, for property B, we need to assume that the negation of phi uh, lies in our set gamma. So this is the negation of the formula psi uh, and chi, like this. So this is an element of gamma. But this was, again, a situation uh, we had in the definition of, of a Hinteka set. Uh, then by property two of Hinteka sets, we know that at least one of the negated versions of the formulas lie in our Hinteka set. So we know that not uh, psi is an element of gamma or uh, not chi is an element of gamma, like so. So suppose that the first case holds so that uh, not psi is in fact an element of gamma. Well, then by uh, property B for the formula psi, we know that the truth value of psi is false. So then uh, by B applied to the formula psi, we know that uh, A star of psi is equal to false. And well, in that case, if one of the conjuncts, so in this case psi is false, then also our original formula phi will be false by the definition of extended truth values. So by definition, we have that A star of uh, psi and chi will also be false but this thing here is just our formula phi. So this shows that in the case where not psi um, is an element of gamma, we have property B. On the other hand, if in fact uh, not chi is an element of a gamma, well then we can perform exactly the same argument to also conclude that in that case, uh, the conjunction uh, has truth value uh, false. So we've shown that regardless in which case we are, so if uh, not psi lies in gamma or not chi lies in gamma, we can conclude that the extended truth value of phi is false, and therefore we've established property B here. Okay, and now we've in fact uh, concluded the proof of this lemma because we've covered all possible cases. So either uh, phi is an atomic proposition, so a propositional symbol, or it's the absurdity symbol, so that covers uh, atomic formulas. And then in this reduced language, we only have two logical connectives, namely negation and conjunction. So the only uh, possibilities for complex formulas are if the formula is a negation or it's a conjunction. And in either case, we've established these claims. And in particular, recall that part A here establishes that our sigma structure A uh, is a model uh, for the set gamma. So in summary, we've taken an arbitrary Hinteka set gamma and we've shown that it has a model uh, by this very explicit definition. We now move on to the final lemma we'll need in order to prove completeness, which is that every syntactically consistent set gamma of RLP sigma formulas can be extended to a Hinteka set delta that contains this original set gamma. Now by the previous lemma, we know that this Hinteka set delta here will have a model, which means that there's some sigma structure which makes every formula in delta true. And in turn, because gamma is a subset of delta, this means that that same sigma structure will also be a model for gamma. Now the proof of this lemma is quite long, so I'm going to split it up into a series of claims. The first claim we need is that we are able to list all RLP sigma formulas in some infinite list where each formula occurs an infinite number of times. So the claim is there is an enumeration of RLP sigma formulas where 
each formula occurs infinitely often. To prove this claim, we proceed as follows. So we know by definition that our signature sigma is countable. And using this, we can conclude that um, also the set of RLP sigma formulas is countable. So the set uh, phi of RLP uh, sigma formulas uh, is countable. Uh, in fact, it's uh, possible to construct an explicit injection from the set of uh, RLP sigma formulas into the natural numbers by uh, so-called Gödel numbers. So a Gödel number will assign each uh, formula a unique natural number corresponding to it. Alternatively, another way uh, to see this is to write the set of RLP sigma formulas as a union over natural numbers uh, over some sets phi n, where uh, this set phi n here is the set of all formulas of complexity n. Now, formulas of complexity n by definition contain exactly n connectives, and this in turn means that they contain at most n plus one uh, atomic proposition symbols. So this means that there are at most n plus one slots which you can fill in such a formula using, well, symbols occurring in sigma. And this means that the cardinality of this set uh, phi n will be less than the cardinality of the n-fold product of sigma with itself. Now, because the set sigma is countable, uh, this finite product of countable sets will also be countable. So each of the phi n's is countable. And then we can express phi here as a countable union over countable sets. And countable unions over countable sets are again countable. So that shows that uh, phi is countable. Or alternatively, if you want a more explicit uh, way of seeing this, then you can go look up what Gödel numbers do. Uh, those give you a unique number for each formula, which also show that uh, such formulas are countable. Okay, so we've now uh, concluded that, well, the set of all RLP formulas is countable. So in particular, this means we have an enumeration of such formulas. So hence, uh, there is an enumeration uh, which I'll call psi zero, psi one, psi two, and so on, um, of uh, the set capital phi of RLP formulas. Now what we want is an enumeration of such formulas where each formula in the set occurs infinitely often. So we're now going to tweak our existing enumeration here to, to make that happen. So the following list where we first uh, have uh, psi zero, then we have psi 0 and psi 1. Uh, then we have psi uh, 0, psi 1, psi 2, and so on. So basically, we're just taking initial segments of this enumeration here, and we're uh, using them to construct a new enumeration. So this list here has the desired property. Okay, so I mean, this is an enumeration of, of uh, the formulas in RLP sigma. And why does each formula occur infinitely often? Well, take some given formula. Well, this will occur like in some position of this original enumeration here. So there'll be some natural number n for which that formula is psi n. And well, then if you go along this enumeration here, eventually you'll reach the point where the initial segments become long enough to include that formula psi n. And because you're now like always repeating initial segments, uh, that formula will repeat infinitely often. We now let 
uh, phi i be the enumeration we obtain from the previous claim. So this is a sequence starting with index zero and it has indices for all natural numbers. So this uh, be the enumeration uh, from the claim. Now the idea is that we're inductively going to build extensions of our original set gamma and we're going to do so based on the formulas occurring in this enumeration. So we build a sequence of sets, which will be of the form gamma zero, which is contained in gamma one, which is contained in gamma two, and so on. So this will be an infinite sequence of sets. And um, the original set gamma will be equal to gamma zero, and then we build up um, our set based on that. So we build uh, the sequence by, well, setting uh, gamma zero to be equal to our original uh, consistent set formulas gamma. And then uh, we inductively build the gamma i's based on the form of the formula uh, we have here in phi i. Here there will be quite a few cases. The first case, which I'll call alpha, is that uh, the following uh, holds, namely that uh, we have that phi i is a conjunction of formulas, chi 1, chi 2, and moreover, we want uh, phi i to be an element of gamma i. So if this is true, then we uh, do the following. So then we set uh, gamma i plus 1 uh, to be equal to gamma i unioned the set containing the formulas chi 1 and chi 2. On the other hand, if our formula phi i is of this form that emulates a disjunction, so it's of the form not chi 1 and uh, chi 2 like this, uh, and moreover uh, phi i again occurs in gamma i, and then there are two cases. Well, then we set uh, gamma i plus one to be either gamma i unioned the formula uh, not chi one, or we set it to be gamma i unioned the formula not chi two, where the first case applies if this set here, gamma i unioned uh, chi one, if this is syntactically consistent. And uh, we set uh, it to be gamma i union not chi two otherwise. Then the third case, uh, gamma here is the following. So if phi i has the form of a double negation, not not chi, and moreover phi i is again an element of gamma i, um, then we set gamma i plus one here to be equal to gamma i unioned just the formula chi. And finally, the case delta, um, if none of these cases apply, then we just set gamma i plus one to be gamma i. So otherwise set uh, gamma i plus one just to be the same as gamma i, like so. All right, so this definition is a bit complicated. We're trying to extend the set gamma, so it makes sense to set gamma zero to be the set gamma. On the other hand, we're trying to construct a Hintika set. And so the idea is that we're now building a sequence of sets where we iteratively add all the formulas we would need in an Hintika set. So for instance, if a conjunction occurs in our uh, set, which should be a Hintika set, well then each of the components of the conjunction should also occur in that set. So if we uh, go through the formulas and we, we see that one of the formulas phi i uh, is a conjunction and occurs in the set we're iteratively building up, 
Then in the next step, we add um, each of the two uh, components of the conjunction to the set to make sure that in this case, um, both of those components will be in the resulting set. And the same goes for the points beta and gamma here. So uh, if we have formulas of this form in our set, then we also want uh, one, at least one of these two formulas uh, in that set. And here we put uh, not chi1 uh, into the set if, well, this set uh, remains syntactically consistent if we do so, and we put uh, not chi2 in it otherwise. And this will ensure that overall uh, this set gamma i plus 1 remains syntactically consistent, as we'll uh, prove later in the proof. And finally, uh, uh, we need for Hintika sets that if we have a double negation occurring, then the original formula should also occur. So that's what uh, point gamma here is doing. We now construct our uh, Hintika set delta to be equal to the union of all these uh, gamma i, where i runs through the natural numbers. And again, the intuition here is that at each step of constructing these gamma i's, we're adding certain formulas that we'll want in the resulting uh, Hintika set. Now, the reason this definition here is so complicated is because we can't just add all of the formulas we would need in a Hintika set at once. For instance, suppose you have some sort of conjunction in your set which you want to be a Hintika set. Well, then you need to add the individual components of the conjunction to uh, the set you're building. But those individual components might again be conjunctions, so now you need to add more stuff. Therefore, to ensure that you've added all of the stuff you need, you basically need to go through all uh, possible formulas which you could possibly decompose uh, infinitely often. So that's why our sequence here has to go through each formula infinitely often. And then you need to go through somehow an infinite number of steps here in order to uh, make sure that you've really added all the stuff you need. We're now going to prove the following claim about this set delta we've constructed. So we claim that delta is in fact also syntactically consistent. So we started with some syntactically consistent set gamma here, and then we've uh, added more stuff to it. And what we want to show is that, in fact, in this process of adding more stuff, we don't create any inconsistencies. So the resulting set will still be syntactically consistent. The proof of this claim will again be by induction. So we will show. Uh, that uh, each gamma i is syntactically consistent and we'll do so by induction. And this will in turn imply that uh, the union delta is also syntactically consistent. So I'll argue uh, why that's the case uh, once we've shown that each of the gamma i's is syntactically consistent. Okay, so we first uh, have the case where i is equal to zero. So we know uh, that, well, gamma zero is just equal to gamma, and we know that this is syntactically consistent by assumption. I'll just write SC for syntactically consistent, so that I don't always have to write that out, uh, is SC by assumption. Now, we have the interesting case where I is equal to K uh, plus one for some natural number K. So we may assume here that the set gamma k is syntactically consistent, and we now need to show that also gamma k plus 1 is syntactically consistent. We're now going to distinguish different cases based on how gamma k plus 1 was obtained. So remember in the definition of the gamma i's, we had uh, these different cases, and so we're now going to go through each case and show that um, the rules we basically use to construct uh, gamma i plus 1 always produce syntactically consistent sets if you start with syntactically consistent sets. So first suppose 
uh, that uh, gamma k plus 1 was obtained uh, by the following rule alpha, which I've reproduced down here so that we can work with it. And let's uh, suppose, for the sake of contradiction, that the set gamma k plus 1 is uh, not syntactically consistent. Okay, what does this mean? Well, it means that we can derive a contradiction based on assumptions in gamma k plus 1. So then, uh, by definition, so it means that uh, there is a derivation of the absurdity symbol from assumptions uh, in the set gamma k plus 1. Moreover, we know that because uh, the set gamma k is syntactically consistent, that, uh, well, the additional uh, formulas we added to gamma k plus 1 must uh, be the problem. So they must occur in this derivation. So since uh, gamma k is syntactically consistent, um, we must have, uh, well, chi 1 or chi 2 as assumptions of this derivation. So let's maybe call this derivation D, and we have uh, these. So either one of these must occur as assumptions in D, because if not, then all of the assumptions of this derivation D would in fact lie in the set gamma k, and then we could prove uh, absurdity from assumptions lying in gamma k, which would contradict it being syntactically consistent. Okay, but now we are going to modify this derivation D so we're going to replace um, the assumption uh, chi 1 by the following uh, derivation. Namely, we're going to derive chi 1 from chi 1 and chi 2 using uh, the elimination rule for conjunction. And we're also going to uh, replace chi 2 by a similar pattern. So we're going to replace chi 2 with, uh, again, this uh, derivation here, which derives chi 2 from the conjunction using uh, the elimination rule for conjunction. So this uh, produces a derivation uh, d prime that uses um, only assumptions uh, in uh, gamma k. And this is a contradiction. Again, by uh, the assumption in this rule alpha, we know that this conjunction here lies in the set gamma k. And, well, we've now taken a derivation that derives uh, the absurdity from assumptions in gamma k plus 1, and we've replaced each of these uh, assumptions, chi 1 and chi 2, with this conjunction. And well, this gives us now a derivation which only uses things in gamma k, and since we assumed gamma k to be syntactically consistent, it can't uh, derive uh, the absurdity. Therefore, this shows that our assumption that gamma k plus 1 is not syntactically consistent is incorrect, and therefore if we uh, use rule alpha to construct gamma k plus 1 from a syntactically consistent set gamma k, then the result will also be syntactically consistent. We now turn to the next case. So we suppose uh, that gamma k plus 1 uh, was obtained uh, from uh, rule uh, beta, which again I've reproduced here. So in rule beta, we've assumed that uh, the formula phi i is of this uh, form here. And so it's a negation of a conjunction, chi 1 and chi 2, that lies in the previous set. So this, this formula here would lie in gamma k. Well, in that case, the set gamma k plus 1 is either gamma k unioned with the formula not chi 1, if uh, this new set is syntactically consistent, 
or it's uh, gamma k unioned with not chi 2 otherwise. Now we again are going to proceed by contradiction. So suppose that, uh, well, gamma k plus 1 is uh, not syntactically consistent. Well, this means that we in fact aren't in this case here because, well, uh, if gamma k plus 1 was obtained using this rule, then we know that uh, this set, which is just uh, gamma k plus 1, is in fact syntactically consistent. So therefore we conclude that we're now in this case here, and that in fact this set is not syntactically consistent. So hence uh, gamma k plus 1 is in fact equal to gamma k unioned with the negation not chi 2, like so. And moreover, we can also infer that this set up here, so gamma k unioned with not chi 1, is not syntactically consistent. Otherwise, well, gamma k plus 1 would be this set. So, and we also know that uh, gamma k unioned with the set not chi 1 is uh, also not syntactically consistent. Now, because both of these sets are not syntactically consistent, we can find derivations which derive the absurdity from either of these. So there um, are derivations, which I'll call, let's say, d1 and uh, d2. And now d1 derives uh, absurdity from the set gamma k unioned with this uh, formula not chi 1. And d2 derives absurdity from gamma k unioned the formula uh, not chi 2. All right, but now in both of these situations, we can now apply uh, the reductio ad absurdum rule. to uh, conclude chi 1 in this case, and here uh, chi 2, like so. And now you see that uh, the resulting derivation, so this subderivation here and this subderivation here, uh, only use assumptions occurring in gamma k because reductio ad absurdum allows us to remove this uh, assumption. Moreover, now using uh, the introduction rule for conjunction, I can conclude chi 1 and chi 2. And finally, we know that the formula uh, not chi 1 and chi 2 occurs in uh, gamma k. So I can use this as an assumption. So this also lies in gamma k. And now using the introduction rule for uh, negation, so I now have, uh, well, at the same time, the conjunction chi1 and k2, I also have not chi1 and chi2, so this again will give me an absurdity. And now this derivation here I've constructed, so this is a derivation um, of absurdity from uh, assumptions uh, in the set gamma k. So the only assumptions I used here that weren't necessarily in gamma k was this not chi 1 and not chi 2, but I got rid of them here by uh, using uh, reductio ad absurdum rule. And uh, this assumption here also occurs in gamma k because we are in the situation where we applied uh, this rule beta. Now maybe to make this sentence correct, I'll just write uh, then uh, this derivation here is a derivation of the absurdity from assumptions in gamma k. And while we know these subderivations here uh, exist, because we uh, assume that, well, both this set and this set are not syntactically consistent. Okay, so this is again a contradiction because, well, we assume that gamma k is syntactically consistent and now the assumption that uh, gamma k plus one is not syntactically consistent has uh, shown that we could derive the absurdity from assumptions in gamma k, so that's not possible. For the next case, uh, we suppose that uh, gamma k plus 1 was obtained by rule gamma. So suppose gamma k plus 1 was obtained uh, by this rule gamma here. 
And again, we're going to argue by contradiction. So suppose that gamma k plus one is not syntactically consistent. So in that case, well, there is a derivation. Um, of, well, the absurdity um, from assumptions in gamma k uh, plus, uh, well, the additional formula we added, uh, namely chi here. We're now going to do a similar thing as we did in the case alpha. So we replace uh, every assumption Uh, chi uh, with the derivation that I'm about to write down. So the derivation that we're going to use to replace the assumption chi by is the following. So I'm going to assume not chi, and then I'm also going to assume the double negation, not not chi. And then I'll use the introduction rule for negation here in order to conclude an absurdity. And I'm now going to use the reductio ad absurdum rule here in order to get rid of one of the offending assumptions, namely uh, this one over here, so that I derive chi. So because I can come up with a derivation of chi from the double negation not not chi, I can just replace every assumption uh, where chi occurs, I can replace that with not not chi. And so the resulting derivation will now be a derivation that only uses assumptions in uh, gamma k, because this formula not not chi occurs in gamma k uh, because we applied this rule uh, here. Now the result is a derivation of absurdity uh, from, uh, well, assumptions occurring in gamma k, which is again a contradiction because we assumed gamma k to be syntactically consistent. Now, uh, the final case is that we were, in fact, in, well, case delta. Suppose that uh, gamma k plus one uh, was obtained uh, using rule uh, delta. And remember that this covered all the remaining cases that weren't covered by the previous ones. And in that case, we just set gamma k plus one to be equal to gamma k. So well, in that case, uh, gamma k plus one is equal to gamma k, uh, which is uh, syntactically consistent by assumption. Okay, so this uh, proves the claim that all of the uh, gamma i's are syntactically consistent because we've, uh, well, proved by induction that on the base case, gamma zero is syntactically consistent. And moreover, if we use these rules, alpha through delta, then uh, we only produce syntactically consistent sets if we, uh, the previous set was syntactically consistent. I now need to show you that also the union delta will be uh, syntactically consistent if every uh, component of the union is. For this, we suppose for the sake of contradiction that delta which is just the union of these gamma k, where k lies in the natural numbers, is uh, not syntactically consistent. So then, well, there is a derivation of absurdity from some set of assumptions which lies in delta. Let's call these assumptions phi. So then phi entails absurdity for um, some uh, finite subset Uh, phi contained in delta. So whenever we build a derivation, we build it up in finitely many steps. Um, so the number of assumptions we have in the derivation is always finite. So this means that if we can derive a contradiction from the set delta, then, well, the set of assumptions that we use uh, can be reduced to a, a finite set, which I'm calling phi here. But now because delta is a union of these sets, it means that every element of delta must lie in at least one of the sets occurring in the union. So each, let's call them uh, phi i in capital phi, lies in some 
uh, gamma k for I don't know, k a natural number. And finally, since well, uh, the gamma k are nested, uh, all phi i lie in well the maximal one of these sets. So we just take the maximum of these indices where each of the phi i lie in, and well, all of the other phi i's will lie in the maximal uh, set because each of the smaller index sets are contained in the larger index sets. So maybe I write here, each phi i lies in gamma k i for some natural number k i. Moreover, since all of these uh, gamma k are, are nested, all of the formulas phi i lie in gamma uh, max of these uh, k i's here. All right, and so this is a contradiction because we now have a derivation of um, absurdity based on assumptions lying in one of the, of the gamma k's, namely using the maximal index of all of the uh, gamma k i's where each of the formulas in phi lives. And we have proved before that each of these gamma k's is syntactically consistent, so this means that also delta must be syntactically consistent. So this in fact proves the, the larger claim that the set delta is syntactically consistent. The final thing we now need to check is that uh, the set delta we constructed is indeed a Hinticka set. So for this we just go through all of the conditions and make sure they're true. And well, the way we've constructed this set uh, ensures uh, that they uh, work out. So we go through each of the conditions. So condition one for Hinticka set says that if you have a conjunction in your set, then each of the components of the conjunctions have to lie in the set. So let's suppose uh, that we have some conjunction, let's call it phi and psi, uh, lies in delta, okay. We now need to show that both the formula phi and also the formula psi lie in delta. Now since delta is a union of these gamma k's here, uh, we know that this formula must already lie in one gamma k. So here we conclude that this uh, conjunction here is an element of gamma i for some i being a natural number. Now we know because in our enumeration of the RLP sigma formulas, each formula occurs infinitely often, we know that this formula will occur uh, in the enumeration for some index larger than i. So since the formula um, phi and psi uh, occurs infinitely often in the enumeration uh, phi i, We know that, well, we have that uh, phi j is equal to this conjunction uh, for some index j, which we can choose to be larger or equal than uh, this index i, where this formula lies in gamma i. Moreover, since, well, gamma i is contained in gamma j, because uh, these sets are nested, the conditions for uh, rule alpha are satisfied uh, for, uh, well, defining uh, gamma j plus one. Right, because the conditions for alpha were that on the one hand, well, phi j is this conjunction, and on the other hand, phi j needs to be an element of the previous set, gamma j. So this means that, uh, well, gamma j will be obtained by uh, applying rule alpha. And remember that uh, the rule alpha adds both components of the formula to uh, gamma j plus one. So hence, uh, gamma j plus one 
was obtained by uh, rule alpha, and so gamma j plus one is equal to gamma j uh, unioned the two subformulas phi and psi. And hence we can conclude that both phi and psi are elements of delta, well, because this gamma j plus one is a subset of delta. All right, so that covers the first condition of being a Hintika set. Uh, the second condition is similar. So here we suppose uh, that, well, the negation not phi and psi is in delta, and we now need to show that at least one of the negated formulas not phi or not psi lies in delta. So here we can use basically the same argument we used in one, so if this formula here is an element of delta, then it must lie in one of the gamma i's. Moreover, because our enumeration uh, works the way it does, we know that there's a formula phi j in our enumeration, which is exactly of this form, for some index j larger than i. And moreover, because the sets in question are nested, this formula also occurs in uh, this gamma j for the larger index. And therefore, the conditions for, well, in this case, the rule beta, are satisfied, and this means that uh, gamma j plus one was obtained uh, by unioning, uh, well, the gamma j with either not phi or not psi according to rule beta. So by an analogous argument, we can find a gamma j which contains this formula. And moreover, the same uh, index j will also be uh, the formula in our enumeration. So in this case, uh, gamma j plus one is equal to, well, either one of these cases. So either it's gamma j unioned with not phi or it's uh, gamma j unioned with not psi by uh, rule beta. And uh, hence we also conclude that uh, in either case not phi or uh, not psi lies in, in our set uh, delta here. Next condition three is again similar, so it's just uh, the same argument for the double negation. So we suppose that uh, the formula not not, let's call it phi, uh, lies in delta. And then by a sort of similar argument here, we conclude that uh, phi has to lie in delta. There are now two remaining properties which we need to check. So remember that uh, property four of a Hintika set said that uh, absurdity was not contained in delta. We know that uh, this is the case because delta is syntactically consistent. So since delta is uh, syntactically consistent, uh, we know that the absurdity symbol cannot be contained in delta. Otherwise we'd have a proof of uh, absurdity from assumptions in delta, namely we just uh, use axiom. And finally, property five said that for every atomic proposition, P, it's not the case that both P and not P are in our set. So moreover, for any uh, propositional uh, symbol of P, we can't have uh, that P and not P are uh, both elements of delta. Uh, why not? Because otherwise, well, we could immediately derive a contradiction from, from both of these. So otherwise, we could uh, derive absurdity by, well, the following derivation. So we have p and not p, and then we just directly use the introduction rule for negation. So that gives us an absurdity. So that would uh, again contradict the fact that 
uh, delta is syntactically consistent, and therefore it's not possible to have both p and not p uh, lying in the set delta. Okay, so with that we now have uh, finished our proof because we've uh, constructed laboriously this uh, set delta here, which we've now uh, verified is indeed a Hintika set, and moreover, by the way we constructed it using these nested uh, sets gamma zero and so on, uh, we know that the original syntactically consistent set gamma we started out with is contained in delta. So maybe I just write that here in the last line. So uh, since, well, gamma zero is equal to our original set gamma, um, and even though delta is the union of these gamma, gamma k here, uh, we have also that, well, gamma is contained in delta as desired. We've now finally laid all the groundwork for completeness, so proving the completeness theorem is now just a matter of combining the three lemmas we saw previously. Remember that completeness says that whenever we have this uh, semantic sequence here, so this states that every model of gamma is also a model of psi, then in fact we can prove the formula psi from assumptions in gamma using natural deduction. Now the way we tackle this theorem is by applying the three lemmas we proved previously. So by the first lemma, um, it is sufficient to show that every syntactically consistent set has a model. Moreover, uh, by lemma three, that's the one we just proved, um, every uh, syntactically consistent gamma can be extended to a, a Hintika set delta, which contains the original set gamma. And finally, um, by lemma two, uh, every Hintika set has a model. So in particular, this extension delta uh, has a model. And finally, well, since uh, gamma is a subset of delta, uh, that same model uh, is also a model for gamma. And this follows by definition, since being a model for a set means that you have a sigma structure um, that makes all of the formulas in the set true. So if I have a sigma structure that makes all of the formulas in the set delta true, well, because all of the formulas in gamma are also formulas of the set delta, that same sigma structure will make all of the formulas in gamma true. So that same uh, sigma structure will also be a model for gamma, and uh, that proves completeness by uh, combining all of these lemmas. So as you can see, proving completeness is a lot more involved than proving soundness, but now if we combine both completeness and soundness theorems, we have that, at least for natural deduction and uh, propositional logic, we have this equivalence between semantic sequence and usual sequence. So the semantic sequence here holds whenever uh, this usual sequence holds. Now, although we only proved soundness and completeness for propositional logic, it turns out that natural deduction is also sound and complete for first order logic. And in fact, the proofs for first order logic of soundness and completeness mirror the proofs we've seen here. So they use more or less the same ideas, it's just more complicated because first order logic is a more complicated language. So if you've understood soundness and completeness for propositional logic, then it shouldn't be too difficult for you to understand the same theorems for first order logic if you encounter them in future.